It's that time of the year when Google launches its well-priced stock Android developer phones. I mean its overpriced Apple wannabe premium slabs. Snark aside, it's a case of large and little again with waterproofing this time with the headphone jacks removed and no DAC on board. Boo! And front-facing stereo speakers are back. Hooray! The Pixel 2 camera is better than before thanks to OIS at last, but you can't help but feel that the standard Pixel 2 made by HDC doesn't feel very cutting edge, while the larger Pixel 2, the XL made by LG, is much more in keeping with 2017, but arriving later and very expensive. I feel as if Google isn't really in touch with the mainstream. Why would anyone buy these Pixels when you can buy an LG G6 for not far off half the price or a Nokia 6 for a third the price? I may have a review of these in due course, or I may not. I'm certainly not using my money to buy them. The thing about the Galaxy Note 8 is that it's not just a smartphone. It's that and a stylus-centric tablet and a pocket computer all in one. Even though there are annoyances, there's no escaping the raw power and flexibility of the Note 8. It's beautiful. It's immaculately built and it packs enormous productivity and performance punches. Apple and others like to proclaim that their phones are, quote, what smartphones have become. But as I hold the Note 8, I can sense the six years of development and the iteration that has led here to the form factor, the construction and materials. The Bixby button, mono speaker and fingerprint sensor position all still rankle, but otherwise the Note 8 is demonstrably perfect. The feel and the size in the hand, the smooth and curved edges, the tiny bezels and maximum display, the power packed internals need storage expansion, use a micro SD card, need to plug in standard headphones as a 3.5 mil jack, need to take great macro photos. The Note 8's camera is right up with the best in that world. I need to scribble a few notes or annotate something on screen. That's what the inductive S Pen is for. Fancy wireless charging, it's here. Need your phone to be waterproof, perhaps to take party snaps poolside. Splash, no problem. Want to expand the Note 8's display to a full desktop experience. That's what DeX is for, and so on. There's almost nothing here that the Note 8 can't do. You do, of course, have to pay for all this with the Note 8, currently the highest priced regular smartphone in the world at around £850 in the UK, currently including VAT. But it's worth it if you want it all. If you can't afford the Note 8, then just get any number of other Samsungs, right down to the S7 Edge at a mere £400 now, under half the price, and you'll have 90% of the functionality. But if you want 100%, if you want the whole enchilada, then the Note 8 is worth straining your wallet for. It's true that part of my enthusiasm for the Galaxy Note comes from the failure of its stylus-toting predecessors. The Note 5 never came to the UK at all. The Note 7 arrived and then started bursting in the flames. So it's been a long, long time since I've been able to wax lyrical about a phone so capable since the Galaxy Note 4, in fact, back in 2014, an eternity in the phone world. The terrific feel in the hand comes from being designed around the new 18 by 5 to 9 aspect ratio 6.3 inch QHD plus display. Tall and thin means a larger display with smaller bezels and the possibility of normal mortals with regular size hands being able to, well, hold the Note 8 securely. It's all Gorilla Glass 5 and so very tough front and back, so most of the time the Note 8 can be treated well quite casually. It's not going to scratch or break with regular use. I was reviewing the rarer gold Note 8 here. It's also available on black, grey or blue in most markets, though this gold finish even more leads to the sense that I was handling a piece of jewellery, a very tough, very powerful piece of jewellery. As I say, pick this up and you can see where your money's gone. The Samsung AMOLED display is top notch as usual, visible in all lighting conditions with super colours, contrast and brightness. The always on display is here as usual with just enough AMOLED pixels being lit up to show time, date and basic notifications at all times, all double tappable as well, with no need to wave at the phone or press a button or similar. I first saw always on technology back in the late 2000s on Nokia phones. This isn't exactly new, but it's mature and implemented well here. The bottom and top bezels are nicely symmetrical and large enough for the front camera and sensors at the top with no need for an Apple iPhone 10 style notch, despite the default unlock method being to use your face. Admittedly, the, the face unlock doesn't work in the pitch dark, but it works in almost all other light conditions. Here we go, press the button. 
and is surprisingly quick and convenient, yet without needing expensive and bulky components that require compromising the display. The screen edges fall away to mate up with an aluminium chassis. You can feel the joints, but they're super smooth and they do actually enhance the grip in the hand. Down at the Note 8's bottom edge is a welcome 3.5mm headphones and aux jack for which many thanks Samsung. Don't get fooled by the Apples and Googles of this world, people do need this port. Plus a USB type C jack sporting up to quick charge 3 standard and the USB 3.1 protocols, so lightning fast file transfers and extension via the Samsung DeX experience. Also on the bottom is the mono speaker, typical of Samsung's recent phones. It does the job, but pales compared to the best phone speakers. Here's a demo, and I've had complaints about my use of rock music, so here's a bit of classical. This is maximum volume on the Samsung Galaxy Note 8. It's decent enough fidelity, but it's not that loud and it's mono and it's firing in the wrong direction. Still, I'm enjoying the music. Average then. And with only one sound output, it's also worth noting it's easy to inadvertently block it with your hand when holding the phone in landscape mode, so playing a game or watching media. Again, it needs front facing speakers. Arr! Finally, there's the famous S Pen. This is inductive, pressure sensitive, and far more clever than a capacitive stylus. A push on its end, and it pops out here. If the phone was nominally off, then an all dark Samsung note pane appears on the screen, ready to be scribbled on. These notes are saved for later sharing or inspection in the main app. If the phone is already powered on, I see it, then the air command carousel appears on the screen, asking what you want to do with the S Pen. Quite often, S Pen use will be scribbling down a phone number or reference ID while chatting to someone, i.e. without having to think on the fly about exactly where you want to store the information. Or perhaps you need to highlight text on a web page for translation into and from dozens of included languages. The S Pen opens up a whole new world of creativity and productivity reminiscent of the stylus-driven PDAs of the 1990s and early 2000s, yet with a larger canvas far faster response and Google's cloud services to handle searches and translations. Having said all of this, just as with the previous notes, most people will find themselves leaving the S Pen in the silo most of the time. I know I did. With modern large screen capacitive touchscreens, it's easy to forget that the stylus is even available. Still, the S Pen is a feature that's nice to have, fun to play with and will ultimately reward you fighting your way up the learning curve in finding new things you can do with it. Around the shiny Gorilla Glass 5 back is the camera and sensor island, flush apart from a raised metallic ring for protection purposes. Still controversially, Samsung has included the fingerprint sensor here, off to one side where it's hardest to reach. It's a little ridiculous and rather a waste of space. Did I get it? <laughs> On this taller phone, it's almost impossible to reach with your index finger in normal use and certainly never feels natural. Yet it's also easy to forgive Samsung this bad design because the biometric alternatives work so well. And it's worth noting, this is important, that either of the two optical authentication systems, face unlock and iris unlock, can be used at the same time as the fingerprint sensor, i.e. you can leave two out of the three systems live all the time. On my smartphones, any really sensitive data is behind an encrypted database password, so the simple face unlock and fingerprint sensor backup is more than sufficient for me. Also on the back island is the traditional Samsung uh, heart rate sensor and oxygen saturation sensor. These are used with Samsung Health and are well worth taking advantage of. Uh, this is another string to the Note 8's already extensive bow, helping you get fitter and stay healthier. Plus the single LED for the dual camera. Not that you'll need flash very often. We're now talking about dual OIS equipped 12 megapixel sensors, one f over 1.7 and one over 2.5 inch sensor size and with traditional field of view, one f over 2.4 and one over 3.6 inch sensor size because of the two times telephoto lens. Both have the focus pixel system and have lightning quick focus times. Put it all together and the Note 8 produces fabulous photos in almost all light conditions, zoomed and unzoomed. In my tests, it's right up with the Apple iPhone 8 Plus and the best in the current smartphone world. I realise that some people prefer having a wide angle camera as the second unit in a phone and there's a definite place for landscape photos, but I prefer the optically zoomed option here. You see, it's not just about 
getting closer to faraway subjects that you do, and it's very helpful. You also get super close optically to average subjects, for example, a pretty flower, turning the shot from a snap into a DSLR style piece of art. The exact chipset used in the Note 8 varies, as is traditional, according to where you are in the world. USA users get a Snapdragon 835, everybody else gets an Exynos 8895, all with 6 gigabytes of RAM. Wow, 64 gigabytes is the standard internal disk size that you can get more in some regions, plus micro SD, and again, this seems like the perfect configuration for a 2017 flagship. Yes, Apple and Google are keeping down the route of a single storage disk and no expansion, but thankfully, most other manufacturers give users the option to add capacity as and when needed via card. Battery capacity is 3300 mAh, so large without being class leading, but then Samsung had to scale things back here slightly to avoid the risk of a Note 7 disaster where they tried to cram too large a battery into too small a space. I called it first, by the way, guys. And day-to-day -day battery life will never be an issue here if the buyer takes advantage of yet another Note 8 feature, Qi wireless charging. Now, this is making something of a comeback thanks to Apple's recent adoption, but Samsung has had it for years, of course. The idea is that you have pads, Qi pads, at the office and around the home or wherever you put the Note 8 down. So it's picking up charge every single time. So it should spend a lot of the day at or near 100%. Hello, Bixby. Hi, there. What's the weather doing today? Looks like it's clear today with a temperature of six. Turn off Bluetooth. Okay, it's off. I'm slowly, ever so slowly, starting to get the hang of what Samsung is trying to do with Bixby. It's not a direct replacement for Google Assistant, which is also here, by the way. It's a method of giving a complete voice interface to the phone's functions, or at least it's supposed to be. I went around half an hour of trying common actions and common applications, and it got about half of them right, half, which means that it got about half of them wrong, usually requiring me to back out of whatever it had done and then do the right thing manually. In short, Bixby is not there yet. It is overlapped by the also present Google Assistant, Google Now and all of that, and it certainly doesn't yet warrant a button on of its own, but maybe the, the updates will bring this to it. Elsewhere, the software experience is pretty much identical to that in the existing Samsung Galaxy S8 range. Android 7.1.1, the Samsung Experience 8.5 serve up a refreshingly light skin and a familiar user interface at every turn. I still don't like the way all the application icons are sanitized into squircles, mind you, and there are plenty of user interface panes which still come off as garish and cartoony. But on the whole, it will be churlish to complain too much. Samsung's doing a good job of keeping the platform up to date in terms of security patches, albeit a month behind the Google Pixels. Plus, there's all that S Pen goodness. The virtual home button with haptics that pulse when you press it works surprisingly well, as it did on the S8 range. And we can thankfully consign Galaxy Notes with physical, mechanical, clunky home buttons to history. The bundle applications are familiar too, with Samsung's internet browser complete with ad blocking extensions available. These work really well. A Galaxy apps for specific Samsung extras, Microsoft Office, OneDrive, Facebook, Samsung Payers bundle giving extra payment opportunities over and above non Samsung phones because of the MagStripe emulating loop technology built in here, as well as NFC. Two different ways to pay effectively. There's simply so much to like here in terms of hardware and software flexibility that any small missteps like the fingerprint sensor positioning can be overlooked. Without doubt, this is the most capable smartphone in the world right now, and it'll probably stay king until the Note 9 arrives in 2018. You do, of course, have to pay to acquire all this hardware and software tech. But at least you can see where your money's going. The Apple iPhones and Google Pixels of this world can be described as overpriced or aspirational, depending on your point of view. But the Galaxy Note 8 is simply the most functionality for the most money. And you can't argue against that. That the Note 8 is also a real beauty in the hand is the icing on the cake.